Good evening, everyone. I, I feel extremely honored to welcome you all to this particular session, which in fact is part of the series of talks in the Literature Festival on the makers of modern India. There are in fact three talks on this. The first one was on Gandhi and the second this evening is on uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and the third one is of course on Bia Ambedkar. And before we begin, I know the fact that I'm very well aware of the fact that to introduce someone like Dr. Shashi Taru, one of the uh, renowned and respected speakers of our time and one of the prolific and best-selling authors of our time and one of the celebrated diplomats of our time. So to introduce some, someone like him uh, wouldn't be necessary at all. I, I know that. But uh, before we begin, let me tell you a few words on, not on the speaker, but about his book, Nehru, The Invention of India. So uh, he was asked why Nehru and why now? He quickly replied uh, while addressing a gathering in Texas in the United States in 2003, I guess in 2004. And he replied, Nehru in some ways seems in being uh, repudiated in his own country and everywhere else in the world. So let's hear the rest from the guest himself. And it's a great honor, sir, to welcome you to this session, 2019 KLF. And welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. And sorry about the delay. I was stuck in the most unbelievable traffic. But when I see the crowd here, I can understand the crowd on the roads as well. Great to see you all. Thank you. If you have a question, you can ask me some side. But if you have a question, you can ask me some side. So, therefore, I will speak in English. But if any of you have questions in Malayalam, I'll be happy to try and respond. We'll have a, an exchange with you. Okay. For Malayalam, I'll ask you some side. So, let me ask, start off with the same question that Ashik asked Why Nehru? Why now? Why Nehru? Because I think he's one of the more remarkable figures of the 20th century. And I don't just mean in Indian politics, I mean on the global stage. And why now? I wrote the book 15 years ago when the NDA government was in power and seemed to be critiquing many of the things for which Nehru stood. But today, the moral urgency of reclaiming that ground is so much greater because we have a government in power today that is directly trying to repudiate everything that Jawaharlal Nehru stands for and has done. So this is why it was important to examine the legacy of Nehru from the perspective of our time. And I'll just read you a couple of uh, lines from my introductory section where I say, the truth is that Jawaharlal Nehru's extraordinary life and career is part of the inheritance of every Indian. His impact on India is too great not to be re-examined periodically. His legacy is ours, whether we agree with everything he stood for or not. What we are today, both for good and for ill, we owe in great measure to one man. This is his story. Now, if I were to look at the legacy of Jawaharlal Nehru today, as you know, it's now already 54 years since he passed away. One, is, one has a certain perspective of distance, and at the same time, one has an increasing sense of marvel as one looks at what the man accomplished. He became India's Prime Minister in August 1947, in January 1948, Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated by December 1950. Sardar Vallabhai Patel, the only other Congress leader who could be said to enjoy comparable stature at that time, also passed away. From then onwards, Nehru was an unchallenged figure in Indian politics. And if I were to look back on that period, it is all the more striking that the most important contribution that I would lay at Nehru's feet in those first 17 years of India's independence 
would be his contribution to building India's democracy. Precisely because he had the power, the authority, the popularity to do the opposite. He could have gone the way of so many other leaders, post-colonial heroes in developing countries, who in so many cases, when you look at Nkrumah in Ghana, Kaunda in Zambia, Nyerere in Tanzania, there are so many examples of leaders of anti-colonial struggles who brought their nation to freedom and then turned into dictators, arguing always plausibly that they needed autocratic rule in order to promote the unity of the country and to direct development. Nehru could have made that argument. Remember that when he came to power, it was after the tragedy of partition, when the flames of violence were burning across the land, a million people were killed, 13 million were displaced, billions of rupees of property damage occurred, refugees were pouring across the new frontiers, the whole nation was completely unsettled. And yet Nehru insisted upon retaining democracy and the democratic way of life. Next door in Pakistan, the first military coup occurred within a few years of independence. In India, democracy instead was deeply entrenched. And one of the striking things is this is so much Nehru's instinct. Because before independence, an article had appeared in the very prestigious in those days, it no longer exists now, Calcutta publication, The Modern Review. And in that article, there was an attack on Jawaharlal Nehru, having watched him campaign during the 1937 elections. The anonymous author of the article said, we must be wary of giving too many temptations to Nehru. He enjoys his own popularity too much. India wants no Caesars. Only years later was it discovered that the author of that attack on Nehru was none other than Nehru himself. And why did he write that article? Because he wanted to send the message across that in a democracy, no leader is bigger than the country, the institutions, the state. And as prime minister, he lived up to that. It was striking that whenever he was crossed in the cabinet, if people disagreed with him, his instinct was to offer his resignation. It was not the instinct of a dictator. It was the instinct of a democrat. He paid a great deal of respect to the ceremonial institutions of the presidency and the vice presidency. He gave great respect to parliament by attending every single day, by having extensive parliament discussions, and by paying the tiny opposition a respect out of all proportion to its actual numbers. The parliament was a large body and the opposition was tiny. But Nehru insisted not only that he attend, but that his cabinet attends, that his officials attend, and that every question, criticism, and issue raised by the opposition be answered. In fact, he also encouraged dissent against him from within his own party. And as you know, his own son-in-law, Feroz Gandhi, mounted such ferocious attacks upon the government that they actually resulted in the resignation of Nehru's finance minister, T.T. Krishnamachari, at one point. Not only did Nehru do all of that, but the respect he paid to the opposition is there in no numerous anecdotes, whether it is Atal Bihari Vajpayee, as a young parliamentarian recounting how Nehru praised him for a speech with which he disagreed, but he certainly thought this young man had great promise. Whether you think of the Congress MP, Mishra, Mahabal Mishra, I think his name was, who in 1962, when Nehru talking about the Chinese aggression in the north, referring to Aksai Chin, said that not a blade of grass goes there, this Congress MP stood up, pointed at his own bald head, and said, not a hair grows on my head, will you give that to China also? And this is a Congress MP talking to his own Prime Minister. That was the kind of encouragement Nehru gave 
to criticism and to dissent. He, as you know, used to have a daily darshan where he would receive people off the street without appointment, without security. He was incredibly attentive to building up the institutions of our democracy, like our judiciary. So that on one occasion, because he was a short-tempered man, he said something intemperate about a judge at a press conference. Before the day was over, he had written a letter of apology to the judge, and then a rather groveling letter to the Chief Justice of India, apologizing for having insulted the judiciary. Now, he didn't need to do any of this. This is by far the most powerful man in India. Far more powerful than our present Prime Minister is today. And can you imagine our present Prime Minister doing any of these things? This was the great strength of Jawaharlal Nehru. Democracy, democratic institution building. A second very important Nehruvian principle was undoubtedly what we call a secularism which has been wrongly caricatured as moving away completely from religion. Nehru actually understood the place of religion in Indian society. While he personally was agnostic, his secularism was not a denial of religion. He just wanted a situation where the pluralism of India could be respected, where all faiths would be allowed to flourish. In his own phrase, he didn't want to create a Hindu version of Pakistan. He said, we are not going to be a Hindu Pakistan. We are going to be a country that represents everybody of every religion of every faith. And that was the great strength of his so-called secularism. If you look up a dictionary, secularism implies an absence of religion or a distance from religion. I think in all fairness with Nehru, what it really boiled down to was in fact a respect for all religions and the government staying above and, be and beyond all of these faiths. So that though he personally has written letters in which he said, I have no patience with mullahs and malvis and, and sons and sadhus, and I, I'm not interested in uh, what they can contribute to public life, and very strong language like that, that didn't mean that he disrespected the faith of the ordinary people of India. He did. He wanted the dams and the factories to be the new temples of modern India, as he put it. But he didn't mean that he was ready to abolish the old temples. The great strength of Nehruvian secularism is there was not a bigoted bone in his body. He drew his friends from all communities. In fact, some of the most remarkable letters in his collection of, of letters is to a close childhood friend, Syed Mahmood. And from, for Nehru, I don't think that he ever saw anybody in terms of what their religious background was. And he would never have condoned appealing for votes on the basis of religion at any point. But India's pluralist identity as a country where every faith and people of every faith could flourish was, to my mind, something that Nehru helped entrench. I grew up uh, in, but I was eight years old when Nehru died, but I grew up uh, in the years, as it were, just after his death. And this was very much the prevailing doctrine. My parents from that generation, of course, younger than Nehru, but, uh, but from the nationalist generation, the generation that came of age with independence, would never mention the religious affiliation of any of my classmates or friends when they came home to play. At no point was religion or even caste considered a relevant determinant of a person's human worth. And that again is something that Nehru set the example from the very top and made it work. The two other aspects, the two other great pillars of Nehruvianism, which are of course contested with changing times, are his economic policy of socialism and his foreign policy of non-alignment. I'll take them each briefly, because I do want us to have a more meaningful exchange together. When you look at socialism, Nehru's argument would be two things. First, his own commitment to overcoming the desperate difficulties being faced by the majority of our population. The British left us after 200 years of colonial exploitation and drain of resources. They left us with just 
10% of the Indian population living above the poverty line. 90% of the Indian population in 1947 lived below the poverty line. From Nehru's point of view, the only meaningful public policy had to be something that paid due heed and due attention and due respect to those large numbers of people living at the subsistence level and at a poverty line drawn barely this side of the funeral pile. That was where his socialism came from. It did, as a result, end up in a form of state capitalism that became denounced by Rajaji famously as the license permit quota Raj. And the bureaucratization of the economy probably did do it more damage than Nehru would ever have wanted or intended. But it is also true that because of his faith in the state as the instrument to pull society out of its economic backwardness, he was able to create a number of institutions that have served India well, to create a robust public sector that was able to get India into a number of areas where there was no significant national industry in the private sector, to get India into areas like space exploration, satellite technology, outer space uh, uh, technology, which, in which today India is a world leader because of the grounding laid by Nehru. His great faith in the importance of growing a scientific temperament meant that he became for the first prime minister in the world to regularly attend the Indian Science Congress, laying down a tradition that every prime minister after him has felt obliged to follow. He's somebody who gave India the IITs, for example. He realized the importance of technology. And if today we rejoice in the fact that India is a world leader in technology, particularly in computer technology and software, it's because of the infrastructure for science and technology laid as a conscious part of Nehru's vision. So we can object to the excessive state-directed development that we may have seen, particularly when it became, as I said, bureaucratized into licenses, permits, and quotas. But the flip side of the same coin was the laying down of a solid infrastructure in science, in technology, in state structures, in heavy industry, and so on, which India arguably could now say we have moved well beyond it, but at that time we didn't have it, and it was Nehru's approach that gave it to us. And finally, it's easy to sneer at non-alignment today, because since 1991, there are no longer two superpowers to be non-aligned between. But in the early years, the 17 years of Nehru's prime ministership, there is absolutely no question that the only choice confronting India had seemed to be between one superpower block and the other. And Nehru, who had been fiercely anti-colonial, had spoken for the Indian nationalist movement in a multiple series of international conferences, socialist conferences, anti-colonial conferences, and so on. Nehru understood, as no one else could have, how important it was to have India's own voice. He felt that for 200 years, foreigners had been representing India on the global stage. Foreigners had decided what to say for and about India. And the time had come for our own leadership to have its own sovereign independent voice. And so strategic autonomy was what it was all about. Non-alignment was a consequence of Nehru's determination not to allow others to decide our stand for us by joining either the Western Bloc or the Soviet Bloc. And so there is an apocryphal story. I think I do cite it in the book, but uh, I may not have because it really is not established fact. But the story goes that Eisenhower's Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, a man who had once famously or notoriously said that non-alignment between good and evil is itself evil, Allegedly, John Foster Dulles said to Nehru once, in a phrase that has been more, made more famous in the lips of another American president later, he said, 
are you with us or against us? And Nehru replied, yes. In other words, we are with you when we agree with you, we are against you when we disagree with you, and we will decide what stand to take on the positions that you are adopting. And that, I think, in many ways, was the essence of Nehru's non-alignment. I agree that we have moved on since then, we have moved on in the post-Cold War world, the binary divisions are no longer there. You no longer need to be non-aligned between two, two superpowers, but you certainly can represent an India that is an autonomous, independent, sovereign voice in the world stage that makes its own strategic decisions and speaks for itself. And that too, I would argue, is a direct result of the Nehruvian legacy. One final point, and then I'll take your questions and comments. One of the charges that has been laid against Nehru is that he started a dynasty and therefore is no democrat. That is simple nonsense. The truth is that Nehru was directly asked about this. Um, at one point, you may remember, Indira Gandhi became Congress president for one year in 1959, the year in which he was responsible for advocating the dismissal of the EMS government, the, the Congress, the Communist government in Kerala after the Vimochana Samaram. But only for one year and then she herself stepped aside and didn't want to continue. And later as he began getting older and particularly after the China war, uh, people were speculating what would happen. The American journalist Wells Hangen wrote a famous book asking the question, after Nehru who? And indeed, many people were worried after Nehru, what? So there was this question in the minds of people. And one journalist, it was an American journalist, asked him, uh, do you think you'll want your daughter to succeed you? And he reacted with asperity and said, I cannot rule from the grave. I certainly have no such intention. My entire focus is in creating democratic institutions that make Indians capable of governing themselves, Indians will find their own leader. And as you know, that's exactly what happened. When he passed away, the Congress party got together and elected Lal Bahadur Shastri, a man with no relationship to Jawaharlal Nehru as prime minister. And what was important was the fact that he had helped stabilize the institutions in such a way that it was possible for this to happen. I would even tell you that he could well have witnessed this in his own lifetime because after his second re-election in 57, he decided he'd had enough and he actually resigned in February of 1958 as Prime Minister of India. This is not spoken about very much, but he officially sent his resignation to the President of India and announced it. And that was because he said he had done his duty by the country for 10 years, now it was somebody else's turn and he booked a six-month hiking holiday in the Himalayas, his beloved Himalayas in Kashmir. What happened was there was a massive outcry. The public went out into the streets. The Congress Party Working Committee and the ICC met unanimously, passing a resolution begging him not to resign. Letters and telegrams started pouring in from around the world. Both President Eisenhower in America and Khrushchev in Moscow, they both begged him to continue. And it was only because of the incredible pressure put upon him from all quarters <coughs> that a sense of duty uh, to, to the sense of duty to the country prompted him to accept uh, to withdraw his resignation. He converted the six-month hiking trek into a two-week climb in the mountains instead, and he returned to his duties. So Nehru was somebody who was certainly not interested in clinging to office himself, let alone in handing over that authority uh, to his own daughter, his own family. So I want to stress that if indeed many members of his family have risen to the top position later, it is a reflection of later developments, nothing to do with Nehru's own wishes, nothing to do with the practices or the institutions that he had created, which, as you well realize, gave us indeed a very different leader in Lal Bahadur Shastri when Nehru passed away. Looking back on Nehru's life, these are the four big pillars that I believe he contributed. 
And I believe, as I've tried to summarize for you, that all of them remain relevant to the India of today. It has become fashionable to attack him, fashionable to denigrate his accomplishments. But I do want to say that this is a man who is, frankly, above and beyond the limitations of either his followers or his critics. Um, I, I remember writing an article in, uh, in the publication The Week about Nehru the writer. He was also one of the finest political writers of the 20th century in the English language. He was a remarkable mind and he laid behind a number of foundations for the India that we have built and lived in ever since. So I'm going to pause there and take your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Before we take the questions from the audience, sir, let me ask you just one single question. So uh, you are of the view that Nehru is in danger of being repudiated in his own country. And uh, interestingly, you sums up your book by, uh, with a rather sad note, I guess. Uh, you were saying Nehru kept two totems on his uh, desk in his office and one was a gold statuette of Mahatma Gandhi and the second was a bronze cast of the hand of Abraham Lincoln, which he uh, found as great source he of comfort. Touch, he would touch yes, that bronze comfort. So, and uh, you're lamenting that uh, it, in some ways it says that the country is losing its intellectual heritage, narrowing its intellectual heritage because his hairs, Nehru's hairs, just kept the desk and the two totems ended up in the museum. So the repudiating forces are not just from, uh, from his political and ideological opponents. Is it also from his legacy as well? So how would you respond no, to that, No, I think sir? if you want a symbol for what has happened to his legacy, it is that the Nehru jacket has been rebaptized the Modi jacket now. It seems that Nehru's name cannot be attached to anything. Um, the the uh, thing that Ashik mentioned, he actually used to keep a bust of Mahatma Gandhi and a bronze cast of the hand of Lincoln. And I was told he used to touch Lincoln's hand periodically for inspiration to try and drive the, the nation forward to help it rise above the forces of division. And Gandhiji, of course, was his great hero father figure for Nehru in many ways, especially after his own father's death. So um, the, the symbolic thing is indeed that those things have ended in the museum, the successors kept the desk. But it's also that today, there is such a systematic attempt to attack him, to criticize him, to rename everything that he tried to do. Uh, and, and I find it sad because, you know, our politics ought to have been able to uh, rise above such pettiness. And I'll tell you who did rise above this pettiness was Atal Bihari Vajpayee. When he became prime minister, he walked into the office and found that a portrait of Nehru which used to stand there had disappeared. And what had happened was that the officials, thinking that as a BJP man, he would not want Nehru's picture there, had had it removed. And he ordered it to be brought back. So this is one of our great, for my great predecessors, of course, I want to have his picture. That mentality is gone now. That mentality is not there in those who rule us today. As I've mentioned in a different context, uh, when you look at the, the legacy of Mahatma Gandhi, you find that um, there is... I'll, I'll take two minutes and tell you a story because it's, it, it's relevant to this question that was asked. I don't know how many of you have read Milan Kundera's wonderful novel, uh, The Book of Laughter and Forgetting. But it begins with this moment in which in Czechoslovakia, as it used to be in the Czech Republic today, after the communist takeover, there's this episode that Kundera describes in which the communist leadership, the Politburo, is standing on a balcony waving at crowds marching past uh, during a, a big national celebration. And one of the leaders, a fellow called Clementis, notices that the first secretary of the Communist Party, Gottwald, is bareheaded and snow is falling. So he takes his hat off and puts it on the head of Gottwald. Now, a few months later, Clementis falls out of favor as you know, with the communists, he's immediately dismissed as a class enemy, traitor to the state, he's arrested, jailed, and within two years, he's executed. And in, in that system, in the, in the communist system of Eastern Europe, you didn't just get executed, you had to be wiped out of history. You had to become a non-person. 
So they started removing references to his name from everything, including from the days when the communists had taken over Czechoslovakia. And they started airbrushing his picture from all the photographs. Now the funny thing is, according to Kundera, that in the historic photograph of this balcony scene, they have wiped out Clementis, but his hat still remains on Gotwal's head. And that is pretty much what has happened to Gandhiji. They have taken away completely the spirit of Gandhi, everything he stands for, all his beliefs and principles. But they have retained his glasses as the symbol of this government's much Bharat mission. That is why the answer is relevant to what Ashik asked. Yes, sir. I think we can take some questions from the audience if you have any. There's a very persistent young Hello, man sir. there who's raised his hand several times. Okay, Hello, sir. Hello, Shashi, sir. Oh, Myself, sure. Shahin. After you. After sir. you. My question is, in the present political situation of India, on one side we see cultural nationalism on the rise, majoritarianism on the rise, and the influence of Hindutva among the youngsters. On the other side, we are seeing persons like you writing a book on why you are a Hindu, differentiating between true Hinduism and what Hindutva of hatred is. And also we see Rahul Gandhi in the parliament hugging Prime Minister openly and telling or advising him that this is what true Hinduism is. So my question is, is Congress trying to attack the Hindutva of BJP and RSS with the love of Hinduism in the present political situation? Right. I mean, I think the answer is that we are demonstrating that Hindutva has nothing to do really with Hinduism. Hindutva is a political doctrine born in the 1920s alongside similar political doctrines in Europe at that time, which were also militaristic, corporatist, nationalistic, jingoistic, muscular fascism, Nazism, and so on. Very similar doctrine applied to the Indian context in terms of identity politics, but distanced from and unconnected to the inclusive and accepting nature of the Hindu faith. So what we have tried to do, me in my book, Rahul Gandhi in his statements and temple visits, is to recapture the authentic Hinduism that really makes what we call secularism possible. When Indians uh, say they are proud to be Hindu, in the Hindutva iteration, it is a very negative, narrow, exclusionary, and bigoted version of Hinduism. We don't think that's Hinduism at all. We hark to the Hinduism preached by people like Swami Vivekananda, by Mahatma Gandhi, who spoke of Hinduism with deep reverence, but at the same time said their faith does not in any way put itself in opposition to other faiths. It, they both spoke of the recognition of the idea that all ways of worship are equally valid. Vivekanand used to say, Ekam Sat Vipra Bahudavadanti. There is one truth, the sages call it by different names. He used to quote the Shiva Mahim Nastotram, which says that just as many rivers flow in different directions, straight and crooked, to the same sea, so also all different forms of yearning for the divine will reach the same divinity. So therefore, a true Hindu in the vein of Swami Vivekananda or Mahatma Gandhi would never want to attack anybody else's faith. The logic of the Hindu philosophy of acceptance is, I respect your truth, please respect my truth. That is the essence of the message. And that, I think, is the best recipe for living in a multi-religious society like India. Pardon me, please be brief with your questions because we have some time limitations here. Yes, please. Yeah. Sir, I, sir, it's an honor asking you a question. My yes. friends' families uh, are from uh, support separate, different parties, but they all respect you. So my question is, Nehru was a visionary. He had many plans for India. Shastri was a Shastri ji was a visionary. He had green revolution for India. Narasimha Rao was a visionary. He had economic plans for India. Manmohan Singh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, so on. Uh, Dr. Kalam was visionary. So uh, are we excusing ourselves from their vision? Like uh, what they dreamed and it's been 70 years and we have not uh, achieved much, especially in education, I would say we don't have any, uh, since I'm a student, we don't have any education university in top 10, forget about uh, being number one. So what is the problem? Why are we lacking, sir? Well, I think honestly we can do better. I don't disagree with you, but we haven't done as badly as your question implies. Think of where we were in all of these fields. As I said, 90% 
below the poverty line in 1947. Life expectancy in 1947 was 27. An Indian born in 1947, the average Indian could not expect to live beyond the age of 27. Maternal health uh, mortality, infant mortality were record highs. We had disease rampant across the country. Literacy was 16%. And as far as female literacy was concerned, it was 8.8%. So you put 13 women in a room, only one could read and write. So given where we were in 1947, we've come a long way. Okay, so you've got female literacy now up to close to 70, national literacy about, about, about 80. You've got life expectancy heading close to the biblical three score and 10. Education. You know, Will Durant, the American historian, wrote in 1930 that the entire British government's education expenditure in India at all levels from the lowest to the highest university put together was less than half the high school budget of the state of New York, one American state. So we had a long way to go. We had to expand dramatically from a handful of universities to the over 600 we have today. We had to go from, I don't know, 200, 300 colleges to something like uh, 30,000 colleges in India today, and so on. So the expansion has taken place. It has brought into the educational system a lot of Indians who previously were excluded from educational opportunities by gender, by caste, by region, by language, and so on. And therefore, there has been a tremendous, tremendous improvement. You are right to be impatient and say, that's not enough, we need more. We need amongst the best in the world. Why do Indian parents have to spend $2 billion a year sending their students, their children to study abroad? I don't want that to happen. I want foreigners to send their students to my country to study, as happened in the days of Nalanda. So there is a lot more we can do, and we are determined to get there, but it, these things don't happen overnight, young man. And the truth is, if you look at where we were and you look at where we've come, you would agree progress has been made. I would like to accelerate that progress, and I would like to do more. And that vision we, we do have, we must have, and we must take it forward. A question from that side. Uh, my question is, uh, Nehru had worked with great person, lived and worked with great personalities like Mahatma Gandhi, Vallabhai Patel, Ambedkar, etc. But throughout his uh, political life, at least as pr prime minister, some sort of a edging these people out and maybe putting him, projecting himself, knowingly or unknowingly, and maybe because of the vast popularity he, he enjoyed, uh, Vallabhai Patel is also Ambedkar. More interestingly in terms of the caste politics which came up so badly later could have been you know brought into a certain channel where we could have uh, sort of uh, adjusted with them and sort of brought that importance down uh, casteist politics but that was not done was it done purposely or was that just an accident no no it was done in fact both served in the nehru cabinet patel was deputy prime minister and home minister and what is more, he also used to give Nehru advice on other subjects, including on foreign policy. One of the letters that is held against Nehru today is his letter on Tibet, which Patel wrote to Nehru. So Patel worked very closely with Nehru, and even when they had differences, they resolved them with mutual respect. And Patel wrote a famous letter around the time of Mahatma Gandhi's assassination, saying, in our combination lies our greatest strength, because the two of them were indeed opposites but very very compatible and very united ambedkar was a different story nehru invited ambedkar to join his government made him law minister and ambedkar was a very strong and influential voice in the cabinet it was ambedkar who chose to resign and the reason he chose to resign was he felt that the congress party wasn't trying hard enough to push through the hindu code bill there i think he, he he died in 56, the year the bill was adopted. He would probably have realized that he was being a bit unfair. Change is very difficult to bring about with a snap of the fingers. A lot of people have to be persuaded. Resistance has to be overcome. There was resistance. A lot of traditionalists didn't want Hindu personal laws to be reformed and the Hindu goat bill to be passed. But Nehru fought hard. He did work with various sectional interests. He managed to divide the code bill into two or three different bills and get them passed one after the other. So finally, a Hindu personal law was all reformed by 1956. Had Ambedkar been patient enough to wait, I think he would have seen that Nehru did share uh, his own conviction 
that caste must disappear. Nehru actually believed that caste would wither away. Uh, it's, it's an unrealistic thing looking at it today. But Nehru, if you talk about Ambedkar writing annihilation of caste, Nehru might not have used a word like annihilation, but he would certainly have wanted caste to disappear. And I've seen th things he has written in which he said that caste is an old-fashioned idea that would become irrelevant with time. What he didn't realize was in our democracy, caste itself would become an instrument for political mobilization and thereby caste interests would get more deeply entrenched. I'm not sure that even Ambedkar could have prevented that, sadly, the way things have gone in our country now. As you know, we've reached the stage where we're going back to the 1931 practice of conducting a caste census in our country. So people are being encouraged to identify by their caste and a lot of benefits now in our state are skewed to caste as well. Sir, excuse me, sir. Sir, uh, you know the recent bill on economic reservation, sir. Would you find it an attack on the constitutional mechanism of positive discrimination and on part of the Nehruvian uh, ideology of socialism and social justice? Would you find it an attack on that, sir? Well, you know, the fact is that as a political party, we are concerned about the difficult conditions of the poor amongst the non-reserved categories. So if this is the solution that the government can offer, we will not oppose it. And we did not oppose it. We voted for it in Parliament. But there are some real questions which the Supreme Court will have to answer. A case has been presented to them because the Ambedkar notion was that reservations is a way of compensating for social backwardness. That is that the castes that were deemed to be so-called untouchable and so on, those castes were excluded from all the benefits of society and the state. And therefore, when Ambedkar wrote, Dr. Ambedkar wrote the affirmative action provisions of the Indian constitution, they were a way of guaranteeing not only equality of opportunity, but actually guaranteed outcomes. So reserve places in universities, in government jobs, in parliament, 85 seats in parliament are reserved for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe communities. So that was a different philosophy from a philosophy that says that you must reserve positions for economically backward people. We believe the economically backward should be helped. And certainly there are many things that should be done, including uh, uh, scholarships and assistance depending on the family income of the of the child's uh, family and so on. I think it's essential to do that. Whether this law is the right way, I think the court is going to have to look at it and indeed a case has been given to them yesterday by an NGO. Thank you very much, sir. Sorry for the time limitations. Can we take some questions? Yeah, I think we should take two more questions because we started late. I know you've got two minutes left. We'll finish. Right, please two please short questions, one there and one there. This. So we'll right. take one last question from that side, please. Please be brief with your question, sir. Please. We have Where is the time limit. Who has the mic? Where is the mic? Sir. Uh, what is your stand on Kashmir giving the position that Nehru promised plebiscite in the state in 1947 or 48? And why does India sideline the UN uh, resolution on uh, the disputed state of Jammu and Kashmir? And how do you see the killings of civilians in the uh, recent times in the valley? Uh, given the position that even during Congress as well as during the BGP time, that people have been killed in the valley. So those civilians. are two different questions. On the first one, India was very keen on the plebiscite and frankly because India knew it would win the plebiscite. Public opinion in Kashmir had been so angry with the raiders who had come across from Pakistan and done rape and loot and pillage on the way uh, that Sheikh Abdullah and the vast majority of Kashmiri opinion was 100% in favor of India and not Pakistan. So when India asked for the plebiscite, uh, it, it did so knowing full well that it would win. What happened, of course, was that the UN resolution had three parts to it. The first was a total withdrawal of Pakistani forces, following which the second was the reduction, but not full withdrawal, of Indian forces. And the third part was the plebiscite. The Pakistanis never withdrew. 
and because they didn't withdraw, the rest of the resolution became inoperative and it essentially ceased to have any meaning. So India cannot be accused of abandoning that UN resolution. While it was fresh and current and valid, India wanted to go ahead for a plebiscite and they were quite ready to have that plebiscite and they were sure they were going to win it. The second question you asked about the assaults on civilians, I deeply, deeply sympathize with your question and the line questioning because a lot of horrors have happened. I'm not going to make excuses, though there is an excuse. When you talk to our security forces, the excuse is they're on hair trigger alert because of all the terrorist attacks that took place from 89 onwards, particularly the 89 to 95 period. Every day there was practically some terrorist violence, infiltration from across the border, so many incidents of killings, assassinations, the assassination of the Mirwais, the assassination of A.G. Lone, the uh, burning down of Sharari Sharif. There were some very, very nasty people coming in and doing horrible things. And as a result, India was forced to beef up its security presence. And what is more, it was obliged, therefore, uh, to go around in a, in a way that definitely was intrusive. I have spoken to many Kashmiri friends who are deeply offended by the intrusive road checks and searches and searches of homes and all of these things, uh, to which the security forces say, how else could we have dealt with this? My hope would have been that we could have taken better advantage of periods of calm and peace to be able to thin down the coarse sources of resentment and to create a better dialogue with all sections of Kashmiri society. Unfortunately, sadly, that opportunity has been missed and particularly this government came to power and did something which no one would have believed they would do. They formed an alliance with a party that was strong in the uh, valley and with the Kashmiri Muslim opinion. They could have taken a, a major initiative to start a dialogue with all sections of opinion in Kashmir and they wasted that opportunity and reduced us to the terrible conditions we're in today. So I think you're right, there should be dialogue, there should be progress, uh, killings must not be allowed to happen, uh, we, should, we should bring, we should turn the page in Kashmir. But your two questions relate to two different periods and what happened in 48, 49, 50, I, I think honestly India is not to blame at all, whereas what's happening in more recent years Indian governments have a lot to answer for. Thank you very much, Thanks sir. That me. was really wonderful and informative. Thank you, everyone.